I'm Scott Allen Miller. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. And today we're going to be tackling a really complicated issue that a lot of people have when they're looking at another country or really just about anything in life. This is a general risk assessment thought process that everyone needs to be aware of as just part of being an adult or really even kids. And that is avoiding using what if risk assessment. We're going to talk about what that means when we're back from the bump. So what is a what if risk assessment? Well, let's start with a really well known example. We all know that flying is safer than driving, at least flying commercial on an airliner. Even the worst airliners, even a Boeing 737 remains safer than driving a car. So why do so many people want to drive and why do we feel safer when we're in a car? Well, in many ways, it's the illusion of control, and our brains often prioritize control over safety. And when we're feeling emotional about control, well, we don't evaluate safety in a logical way a lot of the times, making a lot of people do very risky things simply because they're acting emotionally and our animalistic part of our brain is responding to traditional threats where it didn't have a lot of time to sit back and let someone else take control after we carefully evaluated the facts. And so we tend to have an emotional reaction that is not very logical and not actually all that safe. But if we only had a split second to make a decision, well, it'll probably do something reasonable, even if not the best thing. What if risk analysis comes into effect when someone says, okay, I understand airplanes are safer, but so the first thing is if you say, but to a mathematical risk assessment automatically means your brain is not in the right place. There is no, but to math. Right, but is when you're coming up with examples and but there's another example. But when we do the math that shows that flying is safer, there is no but. So that's the first mistake. And often following a but is, what if the wings fall off? Then what would you do? Well, it's true if the wings fell off, you'd die, right? You would plummet to the earth and burn in a fiery ball. That sounds terrible. But when's the last time that the wings fell off a plane? Is this a real risk? No, wings don't fall off of planes. It's not a real thing. We could also say, well, what if a meteor hits? What if the finger of God comes down and grabs the plane and smashes it into the ground? What if you have a heart attack in both situations, right? It doesn't matter. You can come up with a what if that will automatically kill you in either case, no matter what. And it isn't useful because we're not applying math to it. Risk is always a mathematical number. There is a chance that things will go well and a chance that it will go poorly and the risk assessment is just which is more likely. And it doesn't matter how many different scenarios exist or how scary the examples sound in either scenario. What matters is how likely the outcomes are. If you're able to completely remove all emotional reaction from the human brain, which you can't do, but if you were able to do that, then what if assessments would not be a problem? Because you'd say, what if the wings fell off the plane? And a computer could say, then you would die. But the chances that the wings would fall off is so low that we don't need to calculate it. Or it's all in reality, it's already built into the calculation that we have. That's already been addressed. So coming up with scary sounding things doesn't make it any more dangerous. We already use the math of the reality, right? We observed flying versus driving to determine which is safer. We didn't just hypothesize. There's a lot of cases where we do need to hypothesize about things in the future. What about self-driving cars in 20 years when we have them? Because what we have now are not self-driving cars by any stretch. But in the future, when we do have them, we predict that they will be safer than the cars we have today. Bent, we can only predict it based on how we think they will behave, but we have some reasonable ways to do that to at least get approximate numbers. So with that, we can't observe and use observation to determine real risk. We have to project what we know and calculate a reasonable idea of risk. But with things like flying versus driving, we have risk to observe and we can say, no, flying is dramatically safer. So much safer, in fact, that it's safer than trains, which is hard to believe because trains are so safe. And with trains, you can't say things like, what if the wings fall off? What if everything fell off? Generally, you're still okay, right? So it's, it's a very dangerous thing. And when you start saying what ifs, they can be useful when you're coming up with mitigation strategies. 
right? But not when evaluating risk. So this is something that all people should know how to do, but very few do, and no one ever discusses. This is the kind of stuff that high schools and colleges should be drilling because this is what's really useful for adult life, understanding that math is going to tell you what's safer and that generally that's the thing you need to listen to and whatever emotional reaction you're having is something that is a problem with your brain that you want to fix. I once had a conversation with someone who was so adamant that he actually said the words and acknowledged how crazy it was that he would rather kill his entire family by his own hand, not intentionally, but with him driving, rather than keeping them safe and allowing someone else to fly a plane with them in it. He prioritized the control of his family over their well-being to such a degree he acknowledged outright that he would be acceptable of them dying because of his decision as being a better outcome than having them live but him not being in control and still ignoring that the rest of his family would be equally not in control riding in the car or riding in an airplane. The only difference was his control. So he prioritized his own personal sense of control over the lives of his wife and children and his own, to be clear, including his own, but this is the degree to which normal people that you hire to make risk assessments in business, because that's what his job was, will have and how much they will allow an emotional reaction to override actual studies of safety and actual logic of safety. And if you're ever wondering why airplanes are so much safer than cars, there's a lot of reasons for it. Some of it is a reduction in traffic. Some of it is how much training and oversight and monitoring and safety protocols and redundant systems exist in planes that don't exist in cars, how easy it is to simply uh, maneuver around each other, um, how many, uh, you know, there's always ambulances waiting. Should there be an accident, your chances of getting care is much higher. There's a lot of things that go into it, but basically we can look and say, yes, this system keeps people safe a lot of the time. You can pretty much fly nonstop your entire life and your chances of dying from a plane crash, if you're flying all the time, eventually you're going to die on a plane, but that will be from old age or whatever, uh, choking on a peanut. But the actual flying is unlikely to kill you even if you flew for a complete lifetime. And that's why pilots and, and airline attendants are willing to do that job because it's incredibly safe. But if you were to do the same thing driving, you would likely kill yourself after just a few years mathematically because if you spend that much time on the road, it starts to get really, really dangerous simply from the amount of time you're on the road, let alone the amount of sleep you've had. And that's another thing is that pilots tend to be very awake compared to drivers. The average driver is somewhat sleepy. That means there's a lot of drivers who are a lot more sleepy than the average. So you have all kinds of things like that that are not being checked in the case of drivers. You, If you have a single pilot who is drunk one time, Yes, you also have other pilots in the cockpit, but you also have that one pilot hitting the news and losing their ability to fly for the rest of their life. A driver who does that will get away with it 99% of the time. It's a very different thing. So there's a lot of things that go into making planes safer. But what does this lead us to when it comes to talks about relocation and things like that? When it comes to relocation, a lot of people, not everyone, there's some group of you who are like, I want to live around palm trees and beautiful weather all year, and I want to be able to go surfing, and I want delicious food, and I want lower cost of living. Hey, that's a great reason to think about relocation. But for a lot of others of you, and a lot of the ones that are worried about different in emergency scenarios, the reason that you're looking, or a key reason that you may be looking at moving abroad from wherever it is you live, is that the world seems like a crazy place, and a lot of really wild scenarios could play out, from financial collapse, to world wars, to just radical political parties on one side or the other gaining control and retaliating against the other. We have had in the last 72 hours political figures who are extremely likely to win an election, saying flat out that they will start punishing people who were involved in the other political party. So we know that this in major countries in the West, in, in supposed democratic countries, are openly talking about political oppression openly. Like there's not even any attempt to hide it. And it's coming from both sides. This is not a one-sided thing. One side may have said it this week, but both sides are clearly in that vein at this point. The world is becoming a very crazy place. And so it's important for everyone to think about what their other options are. And we recently did a video on having a plan B and you know, considering what you would do in case the world started falling apart. So we were talking about some of this today, and that's why I wanted to talk a little bit about how we look at these risks. So there's a couple factors. One is looking at what is actually likely to have. We all have these emotional reactions, right? If you're 
on the left, you're fearing that the right is going to come to power and retaliate against you. If you're on the right, you're fearing that the left is going to come to power and retaliate against you. And in both cases, it seems really likely for the other to happen, but clearly both can't be likely. And the reality is, is that neither is likely. I mean, likely one's going to come to power, but the chances that they're actually going to retaliate against the other side is pretty low but not zero, and that's why we panic. But there's always scenarios like this. What are the chances that any given country that you're from is going to suddenly be embroiled in a domestic war where bombs are falling on its own cities or people are turning against each other in the streets? Well, we can say that's pretty low, but it's not zero, that's for sure. And some major countries are closer to that than they have ever been. And at least one Western country has that going on right now. So these things are not exactly zero risks, but they're not huge risks. You probably shouldn't sit around all day worrying that they're about to happen, but having a little bit of disaster planning and like we said, do some what if scenarios and come up with risk mitigation strategies, that can be wise. That's why we did our plan B video, right? It's not too hard to have a very simple plan B. Well, if things go wrong and you're from North America, Latin America is not that far away and you have a lot of different countries with a lot of different options. Knowing what they have and, and where you could go and what it takes to get in. Currently, it's good information. Have some of that under your belt. You really don't need to do much more planning than that. Have a go bag ready to go. Be able to buy flights, have a little bit of cash in liquidity so you can get on that plane and get where you need to go. Some things like that can go a really long way and that's useful planning when we're talking about a what if. But if you're doing those what ifs and saying, okay, I need to move now because what if things go wrong where I'm from? Well, okay, sure. What if things go wrong where you're at? But what if things go wrong where you go to? You can use what if for any terrible scenario and make anything sound bad if you say what if all the time. So knowing which things are worth saying, okay, what if this happens and should we bother to, to provide a risk mitigation for that is key. When we're looking at things going on in, we'll say North America, because that's where the, the largest portion of my audience is, uh, we, we have a number of things that could happen, right? Any number of things that may make you decide you want to leave North America and head somewhere else. We'll assume Latin America, just given where my audience is and where I am. So that's the thing that's running through a lot of your minds. But there are people who are clearly looking at other scenarios, maybe coming from Australia and maybe going to Southeast Asia, for example. Some things that are really important to understand, regardless of which combination of things you're looking at, is that in some cases, such as where you simply find that the situation you're in is uncomfortable and you think it's time for you to get out, maybe because it's reached a tipping point, you no longer feel that your investments locally are worthwhile, or you feel that the oppressive nature of the political environment is not dangerous, but beyond what you're willing to put up with, then sure, you're going to move on your own. And that's a worthwhile what if to have some mitigation for. And that's really where our plan B comes into place is, okay, these are the options. This is how it works. And if you're coming to Nicaragua, for example, it's where it's worth knowing things like you get 180 days as a tourist, you can renew very easily. Uh, you get to stay for a number of renewals. And then eventually they'll tell you, you need to be a resident and you go through that process. And this is just all you have to do, right? And knowing those processes enough to be able to make those last second decisions decisions, step into a country and know basically what you're going to do going forward and make sure you're making good choices. That stuff is good to have. You don't have to prep for it in most cases. You just need to be aware of what the options are so you're ready to do the right action when the time comes. But this was also brought up. Well, what would happen? Are these processes still going to work this way when something like a full on war breaks out and there's a complete collapse of, we'll say, the United States because of the giant population there and suddenly millions or tens of millions or possibly hundreds of millions of people are trying to flee that zone and they're going somewhere else. And the question came up and I'll just pick on this one particular example, but this is a general case, right? Well, right now we keep saying that tourism is as good as residency. You don't need to be going for residency. It doesn't provide you anything special. The question is, well, when this happens and the world is falling apart, won't there be a preference? Won't the people who are residents be safe and able to stay and the people who are tourists simply won't be allowed entrance or they'll go out to do the renewal and come back in and they won't be allowed to come back in because suddenly there's hundreds of thousands or maybe millions of people trying to get into Nicaragua to seek asylum or something e similar, right? Some form of refugee, whether a casual one or an emergency one. And this type of what if scenario becomes very dangerous because we're getting a little bit away from a predictable what if. Right. What if the U.S. dollar got a little bit weaker than it is today? And for financial reasons, you find it uh, prudent to look somewhere else as a place to live. Well, those we can generally predict 
if this was to happen and it could happen, then this is what you could do. And it's, it's all very reasonable. But when we start talking about the all out collapse of a country like the United States and start, are we talking about bombs falling? Or are we talking about civil war? Are we talking about plague? All those things will have different ways that they play out. So no single what if is going to cover stuff. But also it's important to understand that every single thing in every other country is going to change. Not just because if there was nuclear war in the United States, of course, everyone in the region is going to be affected by literal fallout. But also that the economic collapse of the United States will cause economic changes everywhere in the entire world, but especially in the region. If the United States suddenly has hundreds of millions of people pouring out of it, that's going to change every aspect of immigration in every country, probably worldwide, definitely in the hemisphere. It would not be a, ah, uh, suddenly Nicaragua is taking double or triple the number of tourists that they were expecting. It would be that they're taking a number of tourists larger than the greater population practically overnight. Trust me, the fact that you're a tourist or a resident with your visa is not going to be a major factor. Every single rule that they have in place today will change overnight. And how will they change? We don't know, but it will definitely change. None of the systems that are in place today will exist then. So in your what if scenario, in that case, you have so many things that depend on the what if that it's unreasonable to actually try to mitigate for it. First of all, that the, the original scenario is so unlikely that putting a lot of work into protecting against it probably doesn't make sense. But also, there's so many unknowns that happen after that would happen. We don't know what would cause so many people to flood out of the United States all at once. But whatever it is would likely cause a ripple effect that changes all the laws and opportunities. So you, who knows, would Mexico also have to depopulate or would northern Mexico depopulate? Would Mexico have enough water to take anybody? They're almost out of water as it is, right? There's all kinds of scenarios that we'd have to address. And would it happen in the next few weeks, in the next few months? Because all those things will just keep changing how it plays out. And so you can put a lot of effort into coming up with, well, I want to have residency in Nicaragua so that I'm prepared. But if you have residency in Nicaragua and, and that happens, chances are your residency is going to evaporate immediately, as it would anywhere. Likewise, people ask, are there legal protections? Um, same, same basic conversation, right? Are there legal protections for people who are living in Nicaragua or pretty much anywhere in the world? The answer is, yeah, obviously. There are, are international asylum laws and, and other things that protect people. Basically, yeah, there must be exceptions, but basically every country in the world has legal protections for you as a tourist, as a resident, as an asylum seeker, you name it, there is a protection that applies to you legally. But in the case where there's total global collapse, will those laws remain in effect? Will they still be actioned the same? Will they be actionable? Will they just have the laws change? The fact that there are laws today or that there are policies today anywhere in the world does not imply that there will be any of those things in the case of a massive disaster. And so the idea that those types of questions, that that type of planning could have value in the scenarios where it's needed really doesn't apply. And that's unfortunate because it's, it just means that planning isn't valuable. But often that is the case. We are taught as children to plan for everything. But the reality is people who spend a lot of time planning tend to lose. Planning is a very intensive process. It uses a lot of energy and thought and tends to create emotional reactions that are negative. And very rarely does much planning actually help. In some cases, it actually hurts. And so it's very important to also be able to respond quickly. And that's where having a certain amount of information, being aware of what the options are, knowing your geography, your history of political environments, your uh, general idea of how easy it is for people to get into different countries based on what their passport is, how passports work, how borders work, right? Being familiar with travel and, and some things like that. Absolutely. Maybe even starting to learn another language. Those things are not planning, they're simply preparing. They're having tools at your mental disposal so that should something happen, you have the ability to make more broad and rapid decisions and that's where you could be really beneficial. With planning, you take the risk that you're gonna put months or years into making a very specific plan and having a lot of things that depend on it and possibly investing into it. And then when it comes time to action, finding out that one little thing has changed and none of that planning applies any longer. That kind of stuff's important because when something really serious is going to happen, such as a world war or a full change of government in a major country, then, yeah, you're probably going to have to make very dramatic decisions quite rapidly. But the chances of any of this happening is quite low. But if it did happen, a lot of planning for it is probably not going to help you. 
and looking for laws that are going to protect you in the future while beneficial in a very small sense for example people often ask well what are the risks of land seizure we talk about that a bit and there are very straightforward strict laws that keep that from happening but then people say well what if those laws change well of course if laws change if the situation changes if the country is taken over by aliens like any number of things could happen if we say what if and then you say well what are the chances that that could happen then that's where it's starts becoming useful is only when we start looking at it mathematically. And in many cases, like what if governments change and they decide to act in a way that is really contrary to the way that the world generally works? Well, there is a chance of that, but the risks are relatively low. And if we really are looking at risks, often those risks, and this is where we have to be really careful, is we tend to ask them only about one thing or another. Well, I'm flying in an airplane. What if that airplane is hit by a meteorite? Oh, no, that would be terrible. Chances are you would die. But if you were driving in a car and that car was hit by a meteorite, what would happen? Oh, no, you would probably die. Well, what if you bought a house in Nicaragua and your house was hit by a meteorite while you were sleeping? Oh, no, you'd probably die. And if we ask that thing carefully, we tend to be able to create a narrative, right? We only ask about meteors when it comes to airplanes and not cars. And that makes airplanes feel more dangerous in our minds. And we only ask about land seizure when we're talking about Nicaragua, but we don't ask about it when we're talking about anywhere else, including places where land seizure is much more common, like the United States. Not that it's common, but it does happen. And to enough of a degree that people tend to just kind of brush it under the table and like, well, these things happen and you tend to get compensated. And yes, everyone knows someone it's happened to, but you know, it's probably not gonna happen to you whatever, just ignore it. And that's what we tend to do, right? And so we look at some countries as being very dangerous and other countries as being not, even though the countries as they stand today are the opposite of what we're projecting. So then the question became, and someone had a great point, well, I fear that Nicaragua will be overrun by American troops and the Americans will come in and start seizing land from Nicaraguans. That would be a real risk. And that is something that has happened and that's something that could happen for sure. But that question could equally be applied to any number of places. Well, what if the American army came into Mexico or Guatemala or Argentina? All those places risk invasion and the seizure of property once we're just entertaining the possibility that the Americans are going to send troops anywhere in the world to start taking property away from people, which could happen. But we need to think about percentages and risk. With a lot of these things, we just have to be somewhat reasonable and understand that some really wild scenarios could play out and from time to time do anywhere in the world. But in general, those scenarios, when they do play out, are not predictable. When we have a scenario where something really dramatic happens that is far outside of legal frameworks and political frameworks and doesn't fit with the current world order, yes, those risks absolutely exist. The United States could suddenly have economic collapse and have no functional economy. The United States could suddenly be at civil war and have no safe haven within the country's borders. The United States could suddenly decide to invade any place anywhere in the world that it wants to and wreak a lot of havoc even if it was not able to win said war. There's a lot of things, and this is just using the United States as an example, that the United States could have happened, but none of those qualify as likely and certainly none of them qualify as predictable. And the problem is that if we start worrying about ones that we feel emotionally are more likely to happen than others, we start to become involved in the expenditure of our mental energy and our panic energy and our planning. And we start making decisions, almost all cases, based on things that are not realistic. When something, if something really big and dramatic like that does happen, the chances that it's gonna happen as we expected, the thing that we expected, when we expected, or affects us in the way that we expect is so low that planning for it essentially has no value. And that's where things get really crazy, is that you could say, well, economic collapse in the United States is gonna cause, but we don't know what it's gonna cause. Nothing like that has ever happened on a precedented scale. And that means that we're kind of in the dark and the planning we do while having, again, some knowledge of what you could do in your brain is useful. And the more knowledge you have, the better prepared you are to make new decisions in the future. But planning around those things is basically worthless. You're gonna to have to wait and see what happens and what the options are at the time. What if the thing that we end up facing is the zombie apocalypse and every country in the world shuts its doors to all Americans in the fear that they have been infected by the zombieism disease. Well, that's gonna change everything really quickly. And sure, you may be able to sneak in places, but you may be spending the rest of your life hiding from authorities around the world because they suspect that you may be secretly carrying zombieism. And 
planning for that. There's so many scenarios, even to that one thing, as to how it could play out. And you can look at COVID as a great example of this, that we just went through a scenario where a whole bunch of unprecedented things happened all around the world, and there really was no way for anyone to predict which countries would react in which ways and how to best plan ahead and avoid getting stuck in the wrong place or whatever to take advantage of the situation as best as possible for you. And so there's this really grand scope that's best to avoid in most cases. Now, some people said, you know, we're really happy with, you know, Nicaragua's current laws on, on property protection. They're really happy with Nicaragua's current safety record. They're really happy with how Nicaragua dealt with the COVID pandemic. I've seen a number of people mention that, which honestly I think was more of necessity than decision. But in either case, they like the things that they're seeing in Nicaragua, and so they're interested in it, but they have these what ifs of these grand scenarios and the reality is, is we can't plan around them. And no matter where you decide to go based on those scenarios, right? If you said, well, the United States may collapse and then it's gonna be this flood of people and it's gonna make Nicaragua really hard to get into. Well, okay, but is there something you can do to prepare for that? And maybe there is, maybe, uh, and I mentioned this, maybe being here for a long time, having a good track record of working with the country, being a large employer, investing in the country, things like that may, for all we know, assist you when it comes to time to hoping to have a place to claim asylum and try to stay. But the reality is we don't really know. For all we know, they'll simply close their borders and be like, sorry, we have to protect Nicaragua for itself. We're being overrun with illegal immigrants from all over the world. And there's nothing we can do. We can't take anyone voluntarily. That's a risk that will simply exist. And having put all your eggs into the mental basket, at least of coming to Nicaragua, might end up being the wrong thing. It's a small country. Maybe a large one like Brazil ends up being the only option you have because they're able to absorb a lot more people. So if you're making a tactical decision, what you're gonna do right now. Oh, I've decided that I need a more flexible life. I want to lower my cost. I want to increase my safety. I want to just be happier. I want to live more tranquilo. Then yes, pack up and come to Nicaragua or your country of choice now. But if it's a, I just want to be prepared in case of massive unprecedented disaster in whatever my home country is, then you probably need to step back and say, okay, I need to have a lot of choices. I need to understand what my options could be. But when those things happen, Everything's going to change and I have to play it by ear and adjust on the fly incredibly rapidly and make my decisions then because anything I decide now is likely going to be incorrect and not useful when it actually comes time to take action. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. That means a lot to me and you guys have been so wonderful with all the support recently that really, it really is touching how much you guys appreciate uh, everything that we do here. As always, like, subscribe, share on social media and I will see all of you tomorrow. And if you just take a moment, four videos up on the screen, just pick one at random if you have to. Go ahead and let it run in the background if you don't feel like watching it. That does a lot to help support the show too.